participants. Our first panelists, panelist is uh, Frederick Kenney, who is the Director of Legal and External Affairs at the IMO. He is responsible for advising the IMO Secretary General on all legal issues associated with the functioning of the IMO, with special em emphasis on matters of treaty law and the law of the sea. He provides legal counsel to staff supporting IMO committees and subcommittees, and has a particular responsibility as secretary, secretary for the organization's legal committee. As such, he oversees the IMO's role as depository for more than 50 international conventions. Mr. Kenny, I would like to hand over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Jessen, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all distinguished guests uh, at this seminar, which uh, if I could uh, echo the words of the moderator, uh, really is uh, timely and topical because uh, one of the things that I, I think we're seeing and the, the Security Council has recognized is there are threats to the rule of law in, in the international maritime arena. And I'd like to talk uh, just for a couple minutes about those uh, from the IMO perspective uh, because we're seeing those threats uh, and we are concerned about them uh, from the IMO perspective. Now, of course, uh, the rule of international maritime law is somewhat hierarchical, beginning with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And IMO is, of course, uh, the competent international organization for the development of legally binding rules and standards um, covering maritime safety, maritime security, protection of the marine environment, uh, liability and compensation, and response structures. And if you look throughout UNCLOS, you will see references to the competent international organization, which is IMO uh, in that regard, even though IMO is only mentioned by name one time in the entire treaty. Um, and of course, uh, IMO serves as the competent international organization through the development of its treaty regime, more than 50 treaties covering every aspect uh, of shipping, uh, really from stem to stern. And those are complemented by IMO regulations, codes, and guidelines, which create a very comprehensive regime. Now, if that regime is widely ratified, and we have most uh, much of the treaty regime is widely ratified. The major treaties all have more than 95% of the world's merchant shipping tonnage is covered by the IMO treaty regime. Um, if they are, it is widely ratified, if it's globally implemented, and if it's consistently enforced, then we can ensure safe, secure, efficient shipping on clean oceans. Now that system depends on effective implementation really at, at three levels. First, contracting countries to these treaties need to implement their obligations under the treaty regime, under the theory of the doctrine of Pax Sunt Servanda uh, as listed in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Countries also need to pass those obligations on to the ships flying their flag and the seafarers of their nationality or operating their ships uh, through effective flag state oversight of their domestic shipping fleet. Uh, it's, it's interesting to note that many of the treaty obligations uh, in the IMO treaty regime do not apply to the ships themselves, but to the, the flag states that that operate those ships. Uh, so the flag state plays a critical role in effective implementation. Uh, and then third, port states must be able to trust that the flag state implementation has in fact been effective, i.e. that the certificates verifying the safety, security, and uh, the training and certification of the seafarers truly represent that that the ships and the seafarers are complying with their obligations under the IMO treaty and regulatory regime. Now, of course, we're not there. Uh, we're not uh, at fully effective implementation. IMO is taking action in that regard, first through our integrated technical cooperation program to assist particularly flag states from developing nations and small island developing states in more effectively implementing their flag state obligations 
and through the IMO's member state audit scheme, which uh, is now in its its fourth year. Uh, we've done the, the pandemic affected uh, implementation of the audit scheme, but we've done more than 80 countries. Uh, the big issue is that uh, many, many countries have not fully implemented the IMO treaty regime into their domestic law regime, which then leads to a failure of effective implementation on ships flying their flag. So the overall thought is, is that the system is in place uh, and the system should work uh, if effectively implemented. But we're seeing some things that are really causing some significant concern as to whether or not the system is working and whether or not states are taking their obligations under international maritime law uh, um, seriously enough. And I'm gonna give three quick examples in the time I have left. The first one is uh, the recent rise of fraudulent registries. Uh, we've had more than 15 countries now report to the IMO uh, that they have been victimized by fraudulent registries. The latest was Zambia. They reported uh, that a fraudulent registry had popped up uh, for them uh, two weeks ago. Those registries tend to fo uh, fall into three categories. One is a country that does not have an international ship register and a fraudulent one is created. The second is one where, uh, and that's the most common that we've seen. Uh, the second is where the ship, where the country does have a legitimate ship registry, but a fraudulent one also appears, i.e. another company claims to be, um, claims to be uh, re the legitimate registry when they're not. And the third is uh, where uh, corrupt officials are issuing fraudulent certificates. This is a huge threat to the, the IMO regulatory regime because ships that are fraudulently registered every certificate on board is fake. Uh, and there's absolutely no way to determine whether or not the ship is actually safe to operate, uh, whether the seafarers are properly qualified. Uh, this threatens to undermine the entire system. We, uh, particularly the IMO legal committee is taking uh, quite a bit of action to try to combat that. Really, this is transparency is the best solution. Uh, we now have a register of registries uh, on the uh, global shipping information system that IMO operates so that port state control can check to see if a registry is legitimate. Uh, but there's still a lot of work to do and we're still seeing this. We've been successful in either wiping out or, or greatly minimizing the effect of some of the fraudulent registries. Uh, the Federated States of Micronesia, for example, at one point they had more than 150 fraudulently registered ships. Now it's less than 10. Uh, but they're a real threat in terms of sanctions, uh, sanctions violations, and really uh, illegal and uh, illicit activity is rampant among fraudulently registered ships. The second issue uh, is uh, mass migration by sea. Uh, We've all seen the issues in the Mediterranean, in the Andaman Sea, other parts of Europe, uh, in the Caribbean. Um, and what we're seeing is countries uh, now criminalizing the rescue of migrants at sea uh, in, in direct opposition of the treaty requirements in UNCLOS, SOLAS, and the SAR Convention that persons in distress at sea must be rec uh, rescued regardless of their status or the circumstances in which they are found. Uh, and to see that criminalized is quite concerning. I know I've got five seconds left, doctor. If you give me about 30 more seconds, I'll fill up, uh, finish up. Uh, the third big threat uh, is has been during the pandemic and the crew change crisis for seafarers, where uh, seafarers are now being stranded on ships. We're seeing seafarers that have been on ships for more than two years without being able to get off because uh, countries are not complying with their obligations under the Maritime Labor Convention uh, for repatriation. They're not allowing seafarers access to medical care and vaccination uh, in, in, uh, in, in abrogation of the IMO's uh, uh, SAR Convention, in abrogation of the Maritime Labor Convention, and in abrogation of the World Health Regulations. So we should all be concerned about these trends that are 
impacting the rule of international maritime law. And we should all, I think, continue to encourage states to comply with their obligations fully and regain confidence in the rule of law in the maritime arena. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, in particular for highlighting these practical aspects that are currently arising in the basically daily work of the IMO. Uh, I think we will probably have time uh, to address um, these matters later in the Q&A, although you will not be able to join us, unfortunately, but these matters are so pressing that I would actually anticipate that they come up again. I would now like to, you know, in order not to lose time, uh, to hand over the word to uh, Professor Robert Beckmann. He is an emeritus professor at the Faculty of Law of the National University of Singapore, NUS. Um, he specialized in ocean law and policy and in international regulation of shipping for decades. Uh, he was the founding director of the Center for International Law at NUS, and he's currently the head of the CIL Ocean Law and Policy Program. Professor Beckman, without further ado, I would like to hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jensen. Uh, I'd like to now share my screen. Um, Sorry, okay, here we are, is that okay? Yes. All right, I'm talking about freedom of the seas and safety of navigation with a focus on the South China Sea. First, for the participants that may not be as familiar as the Southeast Asians for the geography, the South China Sea is critically important because as you see, all shipping that moves from Europe or the Middle East or South Asia, must pass through choke points in Southeast Asia and go through the South China Sea to trade with the East Asian states of Japan, uh, China, and Korea. The major shipping routes, there's three choke points that shipping usually takes, either the Malacca Strait, which is bordered by Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore, Sunda Strait going through Indonesia, or the Lombok Strait going up and through Indonesia. There is a AIS data showing the uh, major shipping routes. You see it's either through the Straits of Malacca and Singapore and up. The disputed Spratly Islands, of course, are in this area here, which is in the, it's a dangerous ground in terms of shipping. So actually there is no threat to freedom of navigation on your major shipping routes for commercial vessels. Up to the left is another, the Paracel Islands, which are also disputed. Uh, Next, we have the major problem in the South China Sea, seeing the being the Spratly Islands. Just to give you an example here, those in red, if you can see the screen, are occupied by China. The larger number occupied in, by Vietnam are in purple. Those uh, occupied by Philippines are in uh, green. Down to the south, you see some occupied by Malaysia in yellow. In the middle, there's the island of Ituaba occupied by Taiwan. All of these islands, or most of them, are claimed by China, Vietnam, and Philippines. Many also are claimed by Malaysia. This is the source of many of the disputes. Uh, this is the issue with respect to the how the islands were determined, uh, the status of them was determined by the uh, tribunal in the South China Sea case that ruled that some of the islands, of those high tide features or islands were all rocks. There were no islands entitled to continental shelf or maritime zone. They determined that the features in yellow and white are low tide or they're islands entitled only to a 12 nautical mile territorial sea. Uh, and therefore, one of the issues, of course, is what maritime claims can be made from features and what states are claiming from them. Um, secondly, moving now to the South China Sea, the freedom of navigation and freedom of the seas issues. A lot of the issues relate to China's claim of rights and jurisdiction within the nine dash line, the red lines around the coast, uh, the, uh, the lines put forward by China in a map. What, exactly what jurisdiction they claim is not clear. 
The, also, they claim around the Paracel Islands up to the uh, north. They draw straight baselines around an island, and the, this has been protested by states that say you cannot draw straight baselines unless you're an archipelagic state. China, since the award has made uh, suggestions that it has a right to claim straight baselines around the four island groups in the South China Sea, that would not only be the Paracels, but the Spratleys, as well as Pratas Island, which is also claimed by Taiwan, and then the islands around Macclesfield Bank and Scarborough Shoal. This is a much more serious problem because Macclesfield Bank is actually not islands. They're several meters below water, even at low tide. Uh, again, China seems to be asserting an economic zone from the islands and the Spratleys and perhaps from the Paracels. This raises an issue because it also then it overlaps with the economic zones of the neighboring states of the Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, and Vietnam. Uh, they also claim a territorial sea from some features which the tribunal determined were low tide elevations. The, finally, they have put limits on the right of innocent passage requiring authorization and some limits on military activities, uh, special naval activities regarding reconnaissance or uh, exercises in their economic zone. So these are some of the sources. Now, the U.S. has conducted so-called freedom of navigation operations. And one of the difficulties, in my view, is that they're very often not understood either by the press, or by the public, or sometimes by the governments concerned. Part of the problem is the term freedom of navigation when they're actually being used in a much wider sense than that in terms of freedoms of the seas, including the freedom to conduct naval operations, seaward of the 12 mile limit. But they're also used to challenge restrictions on naval rights and naval operations or maritime claims that are uh, not consistent with the law of the sea convention. So the US under the Trump and now Biden administration is conducting uh, freedom of exer exercises uh, to re challenge any claims by China which are inconsistent with the board of the tribunal in the case. Restrictions on claims of EEZ from rocks, claims of territorial sea from low tide elevations, laws requiring notice or authorization for the right of innocent passage, and claims of straight baselines around the archipelagos. Naval exercises, I should point out, there's a U.S. practice is not entirely in conformity with the views of some of the states in the region and the Indo-Pacific. There are other, there are countries other than China that also assert that if naval exercises involving live firing are being conducted in the economic zone, uh, their consent or should be obtained. Uh, U.S. has asserted that there, these are high seas freedoms which uh, were preserved under Article 58 of the Law of the Sea Convention. One issue in my own view is if uh, you must exercise the due regard in, uh, in order to exercise your rights, the due regard could include consulting the uh, state's concern, not for permission, but in consultation in terms of when and where they may be conducted. Uh, and the other problem with all of the FO, the phone ops is that they don't address the fundamental problem from the point of view of the coastal states, and that is the excessive claims to the resources in the South China Sea, which China is asserting rights to the minerals, the hydrocarbons, and the fisheries, which in the view of the Southeast Asian countries are not consistent with the law of the sea. The phone apps are not challenging those claims. Issues concerning passage, recent passage of German and UK warships has been in the press. They do not seem to have been exercising uh, passage in the manner that the US has done under phone ops. Uh, seems to be a general demonstration of interest in freedom and navigation and the rules-based legal order. Uh, but I think they've been welcomed by many states in the region. 
recommendations I would have is that naval exercises, the ASEAN states and the other powers might uh, adopt a common policy of prior consultation with respect to the conduct of naval exercises involving live firing. Uh, that might solve some of the issues. Recommendation on warships in the South China Sea. China, Chinese law requires authorization for naval ships to exercise passage. One way for the coastal states in the South China Sea to react to this would be to pass legislation requiring that ships from any state that restricts passage in this manner are subject to the same restrictions if they want to exercise innocent passage in the territorial sea of the Southeast Asian country. The idea is to have a reciprocity in a manner that it does not, it was not intended to change the law of the sea or customary international law. And it doesn't, it doesn't affect the right of passage of a ship that does from a country that does not have similar restrictions. So it'd be reciprocity between China and the Southeast Asian countries. Safety and navigation, Fred Kenny mentioned. I just have a couple more slides on that issue. Uh, uh, regulated Beckman. primarily. One minute. Can I have one yeah, minute? Okay. Uh, 59 seconds. <laughs> 59 seconds. Got it. It's primarily the IMO regulations. I just have, there are issues of non-convention vessels where the coast states in the region could be reacting. Under, unmanned underwater vessels or vehicles are becoming a serious issue safety of navigation of fishing vessels and maritime militia are an issue. Places of refuge for vessels in distress are an issue. And I rightly am happy to contribute to the discussion on crew changes and rights of seafarers during the COVID crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, again, I think the recommendation part uh, is uh, gives us a lot of food for thought for the Q&A session, so I guess we will come back to that. It is now my pleasure to hand over to Professor Atsuko Kanehara. I would also like to introduce her shortly. By the way, I, I have to shorten the CVs a little bit, uh, otherwise they consume the speaking uh, slots, uh, because all of our speakers have, of course, a uh, a long history of, uh, of, of um, uh, recognized and prestigious work in the, in the sector. So Professor Kanehara is a professor of public international law at Sofia University. She's president of the Japanese Society of International Law and member of the governing board of IMO's IMLI Institute. She's visiting lecturer there as well, counselor of the advisory council for the national headquarters for ocean policy of Japan, appointed by the prime minister and has also advocated the Japanese government, for example, in the uh, southern bluefin tuna cases and in the whaling and in the Antarctic cases before the ICJ. So uh, a lot more would, would be to say about your uh, CV, but I would like to hand the floor to you, Professor Kanehara. I'm mute. Thank you, moderator. Uh, Asuko Kanehara, Professor of Public International Law, President of the Japanese Society of International Law. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Gwen Hun Song and the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam and all the organizers. Please see uh, the structure of my presentation in my PPT slide number two. Okay. My main argument is that different from the history, currently, the freedom and the safety of navigation have various implications so as to require of us to devise an integrative or whole range strategy of the freedom and the safety of navigation. It is indispensable to, uh, in, it is indispensable in order for maintaining uh, the maritime order in the South China Sea and in the global oceans. The commonly shared values, such as the rule of law and the free and open in the Pacific, provide us solid support to achieve the goal. 
Due to the time restriction, I would like to immediately move on to the first point, the freedom of navigation in the history of the low of the sea. First, the freedom of navigation was established along with the establishment of the legal regime of the high seas. From the 17th century to the 19th century, the two fundamental legal regimes of the low of the sea were established, high sea regime and territorial sea regime. Against the background such as mercantilism, colonialism, the rising power in Europe, such as the Netherlands, UK, and France claimed the wide oceans for free use. This was historical protest against the former world hegemons, Spain and Portugal. The rising powers in order to ensure the sea routes between their lands and colonies insisted the freedom of seas and the freedom of navigation. In the 20th century, as the, protest, as the protest against excessive claims of territorial seas, actual conducts of navigation were exercised as the demonstration of the freedom of navigation in excessive territorial seas. The coastal states are claiming the wider territorial seas than the law of the sea admits them. They are such as Peter the Great Bay and the Gulf of Sidra, with the justification by the problematical status of historic bay. Second, looking at the regional context of the South China Sea to demonstrate the freedom of navigation, the freedom of navigation operation has been conducted by US. The purposes are multiple. In the South China Sea, China unilaterally claims its sovereignty on the disputed islands and attempts to change the status quo even by forcible means. In such a situation, the purposes of the freedom of navigation operation are multiple. First, it is a protest against China's requirement of prior permission for foreign military vessels. Such a prior permission system is unlawful and contrary to the navigation right of foreign vessels that enjoy the right of intercept passage under ANCROS. Second, the operation purports to deny China's claims of territorial sovereignty on the disputed islands and the territorial seas surrounding the islands. Third, while the arbitral tribunal on the 12th of July 2016 clearly declared the illegality of the so-called Nine Dash Line, China has been still claiming its jurisdictional sea areas within the Nine Dash Line. The freedom of navigation operation is also protesting against the excessive claims of China on the jurisdictional sea areas. Other countries, including Japan, also have deployed in the South China Sea the presence operation and the strategic communication. There are, these are the various purposes for which the demonstration of the freedom of navigation operation and other operations have been conducted. Then, I'm moving on to the second point of my presentation, namely the safety of navigation. The safety of navigation needs clarification. First, it naturally means safety in relation to accident, nat natural disaster. Second, in the SUA convention, the safety of maritime navigation signifies the safety against sea jacking. In line with this, the safety of navigation can cover the safety in relation to piracy and armed robbery. Third, as a related concept to safety, we can think about the security and particularly the security of military ships. In this case, military ships are representing their flag states as security in general assumes 
a state-to-state -state relationship. In the actual tense situation existing in the South China Sea, the security of military ships and other vessels needs to be included in our discussion. The concept of safety of navigation with, a, with such a wide coverage and the related concept of security of navigation can be integrated into the recent wide understanding of maritime security. We can share the recent wide understanding of maritime security. Our moderator also mentioned its wide concept. You can see fine example of it in my PPT slide number six. Therefore, it is very difficult for us to make a clear distinction between the safety and the security of navigation. I'm, not, I'm now coming to my conclusion. As seen in the first point of my presentation, maintenance of the freedom of, of navigation has various purposes, such as protests against excessive claims of territorial seas and the jurisdictional sea areas, the wrong interpretation of the innocent passage in territorial seas, and unilateral attempts to change the status quo regarding the disputes on the territorial sovereignty on the island. This is also the case with the concept of the safety of navigation. We should prevent accidents, natural disaster, sea jacking. In addition, in order to keep the maritime security, we need to combat risks on ships and their navigation, such as military threat, terrorism, weapons proliferation, transnational flights, environmental and resource destruction, and illegal seaborne migration. Just 30 minutes, please. This wide coverage of both the safety and the security of navigation strongly require of us to devise an integrated or whole range strategy of the freedom and the safety of navigation for the maintenance of the maritime order, both in the region of South China Sea and in the global oceans. All the states are stakeholders and there are no bystanders. As Robert said, even non-coastal non states like Japan and the US have keen interest in the navigation of the sea routes in the South China Sea. To steadily promote such an integrated strategy as the fundamental principles for it, sharing the common values is indispensable for our cooperation. They are the rule of law and free and open in the Pacific, I believe. Thank you. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Kanehara, um, for this excellent uh, reminder of the linkages between safety and security in a political context. And again, it's a lot of food for thought for the Q&A. And we already have some questions, so uh, we will not run dry. Um, in the interest of time, I would like to move on with our next speaker. Again, apologies that I have to shorten the CV a little bit. Our next speaker is Commander Anand Kumar. He is an alumnus of the Naval Academy of Goa and Defense Service Staff College in Wellington. He was commissioned into the Indian Navy in 1998 and he specializes in anti-submarine warfare. Wow. He's presently appointed as Deputy Director of the National Maritime Foundation in New Delhi and holds not less than four master degrees, so very interdisciplinary. And uh, we would like to hear your thoughts on our panel's topic, of course. Thank you very much. And I hand over the floor to you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, all, I would like to uh, convey my deep regards to the organizers for providing me this opportunity to share my thoughts and to our moderator for giving when providing such a, uh, I mean, uh, good introduction for me, though I don't know whether I deserve or not. I will now straightway jump to my presentation. 
uh, if you can see the slide, uh, I will try to cover the freedom of safety and navigation. Before I start, I've got two disclaimer. One is that uh, I am not a lawyer by profession. I am a lawyer by practice. So in case while talking about legal issues, if there are some uh, places where I miss step on the legal side, please forgive me for that. And second, I'm still a serving naval officer. So whatever points are there are my own. It has got nothing, no relation with Indian Navy or government of India whatsoever. Now, before I start, I would like to share an event which happened just yesterday, which is very much coincidental and uh, rings bell with the event which we are having Indian Navy and Vietnam Navy's conducted a bilateral exercise in the area which is Camera uh, Peninsula and it was the two ships from Indian Navy Anis Ranvijay and Kolkata participated and from uh, uh, Vietnam side Le Thai. This is to consolidate strong bond shared by two navies and our strong thinking of open, free and inclusive South China Sea and it will be a step towards strengthening Indo-Vietnam defense relations. With that I move on the scope of my presentation, I will try to cover the complexities and gap and why there are differing interpretation of this state by the states, excessive maritime claim in South China Sea and propose some collaborative approach. This is the current status which has been talked by my previous speakers. What I want to highlight is that this is a sovereign guarantee by the states which have signed and ratified and close to the international community and they can't go back. And that goes to any country, including China. If they have given a sovereign guarantee by signing and ratifying UNCLOS, they need to abide by each and every article. Now we come straight to innocent passes in the territorial sea, which is very clear. And it says that every ships of all these states will have right of innocent passage. Every state enjoys the right of innocent passage. So there is no question of denying that. And then this highlighted portion indicates the conditions to be met for claiming this passage to territorial sea, which says if the vessel is not entering internal water or calling at road state or port facilities outside internal waters, then it is a passage which should be allowed. Then we come to meaning of innocent passage. Here there are issues. It talks about passage which is not prejudicial to peace, good order or security of coastal state. However, it does not define what is meant by peace, good order or security of the coastal state. Every coastal state can have their own understanding of this and that perhaps gives a reason for differing interpretation of this clause. Then it deals that what all will not construe innocent passage in that there's a last which says any other activity not having direct bearing on passage. Now again which are these activities are not spelled out and again states may utilize it for their own advantage to deny innocent passage to another country. Then there is an article 21, which says laws and regulation of coastal state relating passage, innocent passage. Here, coastal states may adopt laws like they can prevent, but it has to be in conformity with provisions of the convention and other international rules. That means a coastal state cannot make a arbitrary rules regarding innocent passage. So what about declaration? Yes, countries have made a declaration. However, are they valid and can these states are duty bound to use it? Perhaps they are valid only as long as they are in conformity of the conventions of UNCLOS. Hence, a state requiring prior permission, prior information are only declaration. They are not in you know, conformity with the convention and states are not duty bound to follow that. Then what are the duties of coastal state? Here also it says that the coastal state shall not hamper innocent passage of a foreign ship. Period. That means now what happens if a coastal state unilaterally denies the right of innocent passage, which is happening in South China Sea. Here, I would like to stick my neck and perhaps make a provocative statement. The affected state may invoke Article 19 and 24 of UNCLOS and if required, take a recourse to UN Convention Article 51, that is right to self-defense and exercise the right of innocent passage regardless. Bring the weight of honoring the provisions of UNCLOS on the erring state and if required, use of force. Then we come to high seas. Why I'm highlighting is that it says that high seas, freedom of high seas is applicable beyond the limits of territorial sea, that is contiguous zone and beyond as per article 58. And freedom of high seas includes freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight. So every state has a right to exercise freedom of navigation and overflight. That means beyond territorial sea, that is contiguous zone and beyond. It says again, with due regard to interests of the other state, 
Now again, BISC provision with due regard to other state creates a confusion where other coastal states may have their own differing interpretations, and that is what is adding to the complexity and gaps in applicability of UNCLOS throughout in one particular way. I, I come to another challenging aspect of fishing militia which China uses. Now, this is a fishing militia which is also called as third sea force of China. They conduct military operations with their coast guard and navy, but their legal status is not known. They comprise ordinary fishing vessel, but they are well equipped. Now, what can we do? Fishing vessels are immune for attack as per Hague Convention, as per San Nivo uh, Manual. Uh, they cannot be captured, but this is all in case of a war situation. It also says that they cannot be targeted. However, in a peacetime, if there is some issue, they can be only handled by international rules of prevention of collision at sea. And perhaps we need to have a standing operating procedure to ensure and prove that the fishing vessel in question indeed did some dangerous maneuver and hence they managed to have some accident or incident. Now we come to navigation safety. Uh, MAM has already, my previous speaker has said that it require, it has got a very large scope, but I am talking in terms of issues which happen in South China Sea, where a warship, foreign warship goes and the fishing militia or fishing vessels start coming around, or sometimes coastal coast guard vessel comes and there is a chance of a navigational collision or navigation safety. Here it says that the primacy is to the flag state and the state to which an individual is concerned. And if you are aware, warships have got a sovereign immunity. So if there is a navigational incident between a warship and a coast guard ship or a fishing vessel, it should be dealt with respect to the state flag state, not by the Chinese or by any other state which the fishing vessel belongs. Now, let's see what the Chinese tactics are. This is a plain, good, simple place. First, they make a nine dash line. Then they replace it with four sa. Practically, they have covered the entire South China Sea and they say this is their play field and nobody can come here. They have made a straight baseline and they are covering more than the required thing, which is not right. If we go to Parasal Island and all, they have covered the left side says they have covered the entire area. But if we give them the benefit of doubt of those islands, they will have only 12 nautical miles of territorial sea, which you can see. And hence the rest all places will be freedom of high seas. The same goes for all this. Now, the another point is that territorial dispute has got two issues, sovereignty and maritime legal regime. Let's concentrate on maritime legal regime first. And for that, I have got the options. Legal option is raise the issue related to exercise excessive maritime claims at various regulatory bodies, not by one, by all the affected party. Perhaps you need to realize unity is strength and strengthening monitoring, control and surveillance to manage the fishing militia. Diplomacy side, strong advocacy to the adherence of international law, rule-based order at sea, early settlement of territorial issues among the South China Sea littorals, providing military hardware training to and exercise with littorals. Proposed roadmap, we should have mass awareness campaign, law of sea seminars, step one, most seminars and webinars like what we are doing, a set of seminars involving ASEAN partners, flooding of internet, highlight the practice of excessive maritime claims in South China Sea. Name and shame, China needs to see to legal validity if they have to be accepted as a reasonable state. China is sensitive about how world sees and reacts to its lawfare. Early reaction will put them on back foot. Perhaps invite, include and ignore them. Conclusion, we need to focus and always put primacy on rule-based order, conduct seminars and webinars, develop, do a capacity development of Asian nations, multinational exercises, comprehensive monitoring, control and surveillance, regional treaties and strong economic integration perhaps and i rest my case thank you thank you very much commander kumar um, a lot of recommendations and practical thoughts involved let's see if they come back at the question and answer session but in the interest of time we will move on with the next speaker who is uh, andrew murdoch he is currently a legal director at the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCO. Um, that role includes responsibility for law of the sea, maritime security and ocean policy. And I know it's a little bit out of geographical focus, but at, the, at my introductory talk, I mentioned the HMS Defender and I think that uh, incident kept you busy some weeks ago. Um, Andrew is qualified as, as a barrister, and he uh, also had joined the Royal Navy already in 1919. Um, he's the author of the UK Military's Guide to Maritime Security Operations, 
and has published several articles on law of the sea issues. And he's also a visiting professor at Queen's University UK campus. Without further ado, I would like to hand the floor to you, Mr. Murdoch. Thank you very much. Um, and a real pleasure to be uh, with you all um, in various time zones. Um, so the purpose of my presentation, and I hope it, it builds on, on some of the remarks you've already heard, focusing on a particular element, and that being that, that of the flag state. Um, context for this in terms of the region that we're particularly focused on here today um, is on responding or, or uh, looking at options to respond to behaviour by states uh, and, and vessels uh, such as collisions, dangerous manoeuvring, harassment of other vessels, use of things like uh, uh, fishing militia. And you've heard that and just literally the previous speaker, Kamala Kumar, um, referencing um, a lot of this behaviour. So to start off with, I'm going to look at two things. Firstly, the, the kind of duties of the flag state and a little bit then about the due diligence. So on the first dimension, Article 94 of the Convention sets out the duties of the flag state to effectively exercise its jurisdiction and control in administrative, technical and social matters over ships flying its flag. It's a well-known uh, provision and obviously you've heard right at the beginning actually the speaker things the roles of registration and proper registration and lawful registration uh, and the ability to assert jurisdiction and control over vessels that are entitled to fly your flag. Um, it's not just a right to exercise the jurisdiction but a, 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 indeed an obligation to do so. Uh, Article 94.1 is perhaps the most general expression of this particular obligation. Uh, but it's also important to note uh, Articles 94.3 makes reference to the prevention of collisions and other provisions in Article uh, 94 look at um, obligations in terms of inquiry and investigation if incidents occur. So then how, why is this relevant particularly to this region or, or globally? Well, the IMO, as we've heard, has various uh, uh, provisions uh, uh, affecting the, the global tonnage. Uh, the collision regulations are an important part of that. And it's the details of what's required of vessels to prevent collisions at sea. And the tribunal that we've heard in the South China Sea arbitration did touch upon this. Um, and it's view that Article 94 incorporates the coal regs. Uh, and in the tribunal's view, um, it follows that a violation of the collision regulations is generally accepted international regulations concerning the measures necessary for maritime safety constitutes a violation of the convention itself. So it brings those into play within the framework of the convention, which would obviously include dispute settlement provisions. I'll then quickly move on to the dimension two, which is the due diligence one in respect to flagged vessels. That nature of the duty was considered by the tribunal in the 2015 advisory opinion on the Sub-Regional Fisheries Commission case. And as we've seen Article 94 in respect to flag vessels, there is a duty to adopt measures. And if measures occur, of, sorry, violations occur and are reported, there's a duty to investigate and take action. And the tribunal did emphasize this is an obligation of conduct rather than results. Um, but the due diligence obligation is an important and necessary measure in terms of the obligations on flag states regarding those that are flagged to it. And now I'm going to bring that together a little bit more about uh, public international, and that's the law of state responsibility. So as a matter of legal analysis, then the key is the conduct is whether the vessel is di directly attributable to a state. Now, consistent with the South China Sea arbitration, if a vessel is a state vessel, essentially government or operating on non-commercial service, um, then obviously it's part of the state appar apparatus and its conduct is directly attributable. Of course, also, if vessels are under the direction, <clears throat> excuse me, or control of a government, perhaps one, a coastal state in this region, the vessel's behavior constitutes official acts of that state. And this is obviously relevant for those military militia or fishing militia, uh, militia uh, operating under the direction of control of a state. The difference then is one of whether it's a directly attributable action to Article 94, of which there are clear obligations on the fact state. So that would, in summary, apply to the kind of 
government vessels, but also than those under the directional control, or those that are not perhaps so closely linked to the state, but are certainly flagged to that state, and then the, the due diligence obligations will bite. So a coastal state cannot circumvent its Article 94 obligations by operating in what may be perceived as a legal grey zone. If it exercises sufficient control over vessels, even non-state vessels, then they are directly responsible for the conduct and action can be taken. So I think this could be an important framework to consider when collisions and other instances of safety of navigation occur. I've got a couple of minutes left, so I'll touch on two other areas if I may. The first one is vessels uh, without nationality. And then I'm going to quickly touch on, as you'd expect me to, uh, uh, innocent passage of warships. So the first thing is on vessels without nationality. So general, the international law and the convention itself is generally silent on the nature of jurisdiction which can be exercised over vessels without nationality. Two general views emerge. One, a broad view, is that the vessel can be subject to the jurisdiction of any state. And a more narrow view is that some further nexus, jurisdictional connection or permissive rule is required to justify action against such ships, such as seizure or criminal enforcement action. The UK considers that the, uh, there are strong arguments in favour of the broader view, as in to be able to exercise jurisdiction over these matters. Uh, and in fact, our, our domestic legislation provides for this in, in certain areas. And of course, as a matter of public policy, there are strong arguments to support that approach. Um, these rights of freedom of navigation states are, 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 are clearly enshrined in the convention, um, but th there is clearly risks if they are also states that are not subject to the same controls by the state, but yet so somehow benefit from those same freedoms. And so uh, uh, having a control and abil inability to operate as some kind of floating sanctuary free from authority is, uh, is in quite an important area. If you're to prevent for, for example, uh, illicit actors from using such vessels to carry out uh, activities free from the oversight of flag states. So the issue here, if we're looking at recommendations, is one of what do coastal states do over vessels of nationality? You would assume they exercise jurisdiction of their own flag, flag vessels, as is required under the convention, but do they also extend their domestic legislation to these other sums of vessels, or are they effectively uh, quasi immune from this jurisdiction unless they enter their ports or perhaps territorial seas? And then the last closing remarks on uh, innocent passage of warship, it has been touched on before. I won't go over the relevant provisions which have been expertly put forward by the previous speaker, but quite just, just to emphasize that the UK position, and it's a very long standing position, um, is that we consider that the right of innocent passage through the territorial sea includes that of warships and government ships operated from non-commercial service. And these have not been subject to notification or authorization. So in incidents like HMS Defender or others, that's the position we take. Uh, and that's just on time. That's my mark. So very happy to follow up any of that in Q&A. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I, I admire the uh, exact landing at uh, eight minutes. Uh, that was perfect. <laughs> Um, by the way, before we get to the, our last panelist, um, um, since you raised the issue of questions, we already have a couple of questions in the chat, but it will be possible for participants also to raise their hands once we have finished and then to ask specific questions directed at individual panelists. We would then ask you also to identify yourself and to indicate uh, to whom uh, your question is addressed, but we already have some questions, so there is enough room for discussion as I also anticipated. Our last speaker for today is Dr. Christian Wirth from the research, he's a research fellow at the German Institute for Global and Area Studies, uh, GIGA in Hamburg. Greetings to my former place of business, so to speak. Um, and he's also adjunct research fellow at the Griffith Asia Institute in Brisbane. From your CV, I can see that you have been uh, lecturing and researching in uh, all over the world, for example, in uh, Japan at Waseda University. Uh, you have previously worked for the Swiss, Swiss Federal Department of Defense Civil Protection, and uh, you also taught at Sofia University, Tohoku, and Leiden Universities. 
Last um, element that is also relevant for uh, today's discussion is that Mr. Wirth, Dr. Wirth has, has published a book uh, which is entitled Danger, Development and Legitimacy in East Asian Maritime Politics, Securing the Sea, Securing the State. So that is very relevant for our discussion. And uh, without further ado, I would hand over the floor to you to conclude our presentations for this session. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, indeed also for the invitation to participate in this uh, expert discussion. Um, looking back at the last two decades and the development surrounding the freedom of navigation, um, I think we can see a major paradox or conundrum emerging. Um, not only, but especially in the semi enclosed seas of East Asia, uh, states have been employing increasingly uh, diverse range of tools for expanding their sovereign control. Uh, sovereign territories and sovereign rights beyond these territories. And recent legal and political actions, such as the incorporation of more maritime space into domestic administrative structures or the declaration of new air defense identification zones, actually and potentially limit the freedom of navigation further. Now, um, increasing public awareness, political support, and also legal practice for upholding the freedom of navigation freedoms of navigation have been largely ineffective, I would say, in mitigate, mitigating these long-term uh, developments. And uh, in fact, the legal norms and settings that at times uh, had the opposite effect. Uh, coastal states um, have perceived the needs to demonstrate effective control, to create effectivity, or to maintain this disputed, disputed nature of certain claims and, and thus stoke political tensions. And these tensions promoted additional efforts by states to secure the freedom of navigation or open seas have implicitly and explicitly motivated, uh, but also been used to justify the expansion of sovereign control, such as uh, perhaps most uh, impressively through the, the construction of military installations uh, across major shipping routes along entire island chains in the West Pacific, as well as uh, partially also in the Indian Ocean. In the Bay of Bengal. So I think we are recently witnessing a partial repoliticization of the UNCLOS package deal, which came uh, into reality uh, also thanks to um, the introduction of the um, regime of the exclusive economic zone to mitigate uh, these major competing interests. So, according to Article 58, the high seas freedoms uh, referred to in Article 87, they um, extend to the exclusive economic zones. And these freedoms shall be exercised by, court by all states with due regard for the interests of other states in their ex exercise of the freedom of the high seas. Uh, yet, the history of UNCLOS free negotiations and also current practice uh, shows that coastal states have long been harboring national security concerns and require prior notice or, or authorization for navigation of warships uh, in, in several zones, and they have also been prohibited from certain activities altogether. Uh, for instance, if you look at the study by Stuart Kenny from 2007, he identified more than 50 countries, mostly non-Western states with the following histories, but also um, Estonia, Finland, Malta, Portugal, and Denmark, for instance, uh, imposing security, politically motivated risk uh, limits. So, in fact, um, it is broad security considerations both uh, that lead to the use or misuse of EZ for keeping foreign naval forces at bay, and also that uh, lead to states to assert their freedom of navigation for conducting military surveillance and in particular search of versus for intensified manners. So while the prevailing view is that military activities in EZ are only constituting threats to international peace and security uh, and are therefore uh, violating international law if they are directly related to hostilities, um, but uh, still uh, the interpretation of what is a threat and what the degree of threat is and, and, and anticipation of what could follow a certain uh, naval activities is in the eye of the beholder and that creates the problems for the legal regime. So generally speaking, one could 
we can see that the stronger states have been uh, emphasizing the freedom of navigation more than weaker states who have been using the law to trying to use the law to fend off uh, unwanted visits in the AEZ. Um, the same countries have not really hesitated to sometimes also do the same things or military activities they don't they don't want to have in their own EZ in other countries, but even uh, weaker countries EZ. Or if they didn't, they have been allying with bigger, stronger countries who do this as well. In addition, uh, we can see that alliance relationships reinforce antagonism as they render violations of uh, such uh, limits uh, of the freedom of navigation between allies relatively unproblematic, while at the same time magnifying third parties' infringement of these uh, freedoms of navigation. Not least, and I think we have heard that before from Professor Beckman, uh, it's, it's, it's an issue that um, public perceptions, even officials at times, uh, are not very clear in communicating what the law actually is. So you would uh, see that especially also experts, or policy experts, political scientists, uh, would uh, prioritize national interests ahead of the freedom of the seas when they are the, the either of their own country. Um, and they do this even though the governments would state uh, the official position that freedom of navigation is uh, fully upheld. In this. So what can be done to address this conundrum? Um, I, I think the use of the freedom of navigation law has worked very well for mobilizing regional and extra-regional actors to symbolically oppose especially Chinese excessive uh, over the maritime claims. Um, but the difficulty that we've seen in sending clear legal but also even political uh, signals uh, that, you, that could support the freedom of navigation and uh, not least the ineffectiveness of these operations, whether they are called freedom of navigation or not, they have been ineffective and not enough to actually stop uh, the fact of expansion of claims and practices. So, uh, and therefore, I think we need to look for combinations of legal and political measures. Um, and we need to uh, make sure that, um, first of all, we can't afford to ignore uh, coastal state security concerns. We don't need to share them, but they, they need to be factored in in any measures. And second, um, it would be good to kind of de-emphasize the, the, the EED as a frame uh, to use for depicting uh, or looking at what's happening uh, or classifying military operations. Because apparently it's quite difficult to, you know, to overcome a horizon or overcome a division, a line on the map that we don't want without actually inadvertently emphasizing it. So one uh, question, uh, it's more of a question, not a, a recommendation, because I haven't really thought about that, is whether it would be used for the US and China especially to look into a dangerous military uh, Activities agreement that has been made between the US and the Soviet Union some time ago and designated special portion areas where the two would kind of engage in continental security building measures. Um, then I would also think that um, the former the long standing efforts to promote uh, the guidelines for navigation in all flight in EZ or the principles for building confidence and security in EZ. Uh, have been very good in, uh, in really pushing um, practical implementation of the due regard principles. And I think that would be something that perhaps Southeast Asian states uh, needed to uh, push forward also perhaps with the help of extra regional powers who, have, who are like-minded in this, in this point. Not least, and that's my last point, I also think it would be useful, uh, same as Professor Beckman mentioned, for regional states to come to similar practices uh, and how they classify military operations in EEZ and also territorial seas within East Asia. And of course, further uh, continue their efforts to align EEZ and continental shelf claims in the South China Sea along the lines of the arbitration. Continue to do so, they have been doing so before. That would obviously uh, remove one of the major. 
Thank you very much for the attention. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. That concludes our session of uh, six excellent presentations on the question of freedom of safety of navigation international law, in particular in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so now, since there was a little bit of overlap between the presentations, the exact time for, for discussion is a little bit reduced. Um, but still, uh, I think if I see it right, we have uh, more than 30 minutes, between 30 and 40 minutes to discuss. I would like to take the opportunity maybe to break the ice uh, with, with some questions that have popped in during the presentations. Um, and they relate, uh, of course, to, to all of the presentations. So one question or comment that was placed in the chat during the presentations related to the instrument of, uh, to soft instruments, for example, codes of conduct, COC. Um, I would simply like to kick off our discussion with an open, uh, for anyone basically to answer, um, whether the instrument of, of codes of conduct should be expanded, can it be improved? Uh, how should it be used in the future? The reason why I'm um, why I would like to, to put this as the first question is a comparison to the Southeast uh, Mediterranean Sea. You all know that there are frequent clashes between uh, Greece, Turkey, Cyprus in that area. And uh, the establishment of lines of communication and at least some focal points to prevent skirmishes, clashes at sea has for the last month at least mitigated uh, the situation at le a little bit. So I would like to, um, yeah, to, to, to ask openly to all panelists, how do you see the instrument of codes of conduct and uh, established lines of communication? That is, if I, if I remember one of the last um, sentences of, of Dr. Wirth is, that is the combi that 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 relates to the combination of legal and political instruments, but maybe a little bit more focus on soft political instruments. So, I don't know who wants to go first. Um, code of conduct is that something that helps to mitigate the situation? Any volunteers? Oh, uh, if if I may, if there is uh, no one, then I'll start. I've got uh, if I have your permission, Jeff. Sure, of course, it's open now. <laughs> yeah, I've got two uh, issues with that. One is that uh, in order to understand how a particular individual will behave in future or a particular state will behave in future, we need to look at historical antecedents. Now, China having signed and ratified UNCLOS and many other instruments, if they're not following it now, what is the guarantee that after signing code of conduct, they will start following it? That is question number one. And second is that, Anything which we are going to plan, whether it is code of conduct with some kind of pluses or minuses, it has to be a subset of UNCLOS. It cannot be having some provisions which are beyond UNCLOS because then that area, uh, it will have a different provisions. And if I'm allowed, I've got three quick animated slides, uh, you know, which will put everything in perspective if I'm allowed to do so. Yes, I think there's no reason not to share this. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if you see right now, this is what is uh, the area. If we go and global community thinks that code of conduct may be some kind of uh, very good medicine, but if the code of conduct happens, which results in dilution of certain provisions, this entire area may become akin to internal waters because they will have their own uh, rules and regulation, which may be inaccessible to global community like it is right now. Are we ready for it? That's a question. Because it says that there is one provision which says that parties shall not hold joint military exercise with countries from outside the region unless party concerned are notified beforehand and express no objection. Now we know all littorals are not as strong as China. If we sign that and tomorrow they pass a diktat that no other country can be coming into and doing a joint exercise, this entire area practically becomes internal waters or solid or green rather than blue. As per Indian Defense News also, China has been pressurizing Asian member states to inter insert certain clause in code of conduct to restrict Japan, India, US and Australia, and as well as other nations 
from engaging in maritime security cooperation with Southeast Asian states. Now, I don't think we are ready to see that. So what I'm trying to suggest is that COC should be a subset of UNCLOS. It can't be as an intersection where some provisions are different. So inclusion of stakeholders as observers in the process of formulation of COC, COC can be made non-negotiable because if, if we want to go ahead, other stakeholders also should be part, not only the ASEAN members. And that is what uh, I would like to suggest. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, that visualization. We have two uh, more comments. Um, Professor Beckman, if you allow me, I would, uh, I would take uh, Professor Kanehara first and then you would follow. Is that okay? Please That's go fine. ahead. Thank you, moderator. Uh, my comment is uh, from a perspective of non-coastal state of South China Sea, like Japan, my own country. Uh, I'm not quite sure which one is more effective, legal COC or political COC. And uh, around two years ago, China harshly criticized non-coastal states like Japan, US, and because according to China, these non-coastal states tried to intervene uh, the uh, draft of the uh, drafting process of COC in the South China Sea. But I think this uh, very narrow position of China is totally uh, wrong because uh, including me, many panelists today at that the common interest uh, in the South China Sea, because South China Sea provides very promising sea route for non-coastal states, uh, including Japan, Australia, uh, US, et cetera, et cetera. So these non-coastal states are also a strong stakeholders regarding the safety and the security of navigation in South China Sea. Therefore, at least in some sense, uh, these non-coastal states uh, can have some privilege or some capacity to utter their own opinions regarding the drafting process of COC. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Beckman. Yeah, as you hope, all know, I think there was a declaration on the conduct of parties in the South China Sea that has served some purposes. For example, the, all the China and the Southeast Asian countries pledged to not occupy any new features and everyone has complied with that obligation. The, as you know, also the COC has been under negotiation for a very long time. It's a really a question of whether progress will be made in the next couple of years or year. Where I think it might be useful is, as you suggested, if there are issues of preventing incidents at sea from getting out of hand, if it can establish hotlines uh, and so on, therefore it will serve a very good purpose. It has to be without prejudice to the sovereignty disputes, perhaps without prejudice to the maritime claims, but it can deal with uh, the potential incidents at sea, particularly since the Coast Guard's involved. There is queues for naval vessels, but there's no equivalent for Coast Guard vessels. And the way that South China Sea is patrolled, it's very unlikely that a naval vessel is gonna meet a naval vessel because China is sending Coast Guard vessels to the South China Sea. So even when foreign naval vessels come through, they're not gonna meet a naval vessel, they'll meet a Coast Guard vessel. And, and therefore we need an equivalent for cues to deal with Coast Guard vessels or again, and then the, the top of that is the difficulty of maritime militia, which complicates it even more. So again, if, if the uh, COC could deal with those kinds of issues, then it may be a step forward. Uh, that's my view, thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Are there further comments on the COC? Otherwise, I would move on with one more. Uh, otherwise, we move on. Uh, or oh, we already have one further aspect. But uh, Mr. Murdoch, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Just, just very briefly, just to echo my support for um, uh, 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 Professor Beckman's comments there. I think there's obviously a range 
of, of content for these types of in instruments, whether they're legal or, or political commitments. But certainly the kind of first stepping stone is probably at the, the, the end of the, of the kind of to reduce or mitigate the risk of miscalculation between incidents, uh, Coast Guard agreed absolutely and others at sea, which is most likely to lead to loss of life and escalation of, of conflicts uh, in a very rapid space of time. And, and, and there are lots of, you know, examples of where these instruments have been successfully used, um, you know, between Russia and the US uh, for one, probably the, early, the earliest ones. And picked up elsewhere, but but certainly those are the kind of the first step is in kind of mutual interest to avoid that type of incident, and then there's a question of whether you build that on to something much more far-reaching, and obviously raises the type of of difficulties potentially on uh, that other speakers have mentioned. If you if you start going beyond just incidents to see, and in terms of you know restricting perhaps uh, otherwise uh, lawful activities, and and um, uh, that, that have been suggested in this 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 draft COC. So thanks very much. Thank you. I don't see any other hands at the moment. I would move on with one question asked by Yongguk Ryu from uh, National University of Singapore. Actually has two questions. First question, if I abbreviated it a little bit, how do the panelists see and evaluate the recent European involvement in the South China Sea? For example, UK, has dispatched uh, aircraft carriers, France. He refers to submarine operations of France. Uh, Germany has sent one frigate. How do you see this? This it, Does it help or does it complicate the situation? Any volunteer? Mr. Dr. Wirth, thank you very much. A first try. Um, as you... I agree um, when you're saying that, that international law has has, politici has been politicized, and and and, uh, but of course um, this is a relative uh, development because international law has never been apolitical. It's just that if it works well, you know, it manages to not to be seen as political and this much uh, and and diffuse or bring disputes from politics into into courts and other forums of dispute settlement. Um, and for in order for for this function to work, I think it's important that, um, and that's a bit my concern, is that the law and, and the, the norms, also the bigger and more fundamental norms that lie behind it, um, are addressed uh, or talked about in precise ways. Now, lawyers, despite all these agreements, tend to do this, but uh, because it has been politicized in, in the public sphere uh, and in, especially in the strategic uh, studies here as well. There's a tendency to conflate a lot of things. Um, and this is hap what happened when it comes to freedom of navigation operations and, and the, also the presence, the European presence in the area. So I would think the European presence is good in, in demonstrating China or saying to China, look, we are Europe, we are not the US, but we still think what you're doing here is wrong. Um, and that's the positive aspect, perhaps, um, so that Chinese leaders might not think they can find their way out. Way out you know, Simply having being in an attractive market. Um, on the other hand, I I think and partially I think policy policymakers have, have now seen that uh, have, have corrected that somewhat. Um, the freedom of navigation has acquired so many different meanings that are partially not really related to international law at all. So as we have heard, you have these standard concerns for which the program, the U.S. programs, had also been defined for really address this creeping uh, jurisdiction that the US was, didn't agree with, uh, but that can actually not be halted completely because it's a general trend. But at the same time, what we've seen in recent, uh, in the recent few years is also that conducting freedom of navigation, uh, not operations, but even military activity has been used as signaling to China that the general um, uh, expansion of Chinese influence is not being desired. Uh, influence that has at times been exaggerated as well in my view. So then it has not much to do with international law anymore, and all international law is being politicized to the extent that it was 100 or so years ago, when it was really used for political purposes and means of lawfare only. I think that's what we have to avoid and, and 
you know, uh, make sure that we, we focus on the essence of the treaty of navigation and what's important. And, um, but that's not too easy. Uh, if the rhetoric is too strong, I think we see that with the European presence that uh, many say, oh, what you've been doing, the UK or what Germany is going to do is not enough. The Chinese propaganda has, has been using it for its purpose, saying, well, you partially agree with what you're doing. Um, and so you have this tight rope or walk and, and, and position is, is the only way to get the, the resources and, and uh, you know, chop up the political problems into problems that can be dealt with legally and others that uh, need to be dealt with. Thank you very much. I think we have again the two uh, further statements from our panelists. Uh, before I give the floor to first Professor Kanahara again and then to Professor Beckman, I would also like to indicate that we have a first question from our listeners, from our participants. So that will also bring a little bit of a new dimension, a little bit of dynamics and flavor to the discussion. So the question from our participant will come next after the answers the three answers uh, that we still have for this open question of European presence. Can I ask you to limit yourselves to, let's say, two, not more than two minutes for the answers so that we can give the floor also to one of our participants? So Professor Kanehara first, then Professor Beckman, and then Commander Kumar. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, uh, the, after the uh, tribunal decision in 26, uh, worldwide, many countries, including European countries, harshly criticized China. But after that, uh, their voices are were toned down. But again, recently, uh, European countries' involvement in or participation in South China Sea issues are very predominant. I think two reasons for that. First, uh, common value uh, or common values are shared by these European countries, such as the rule of law and FOIP. And second, as you know all, as you all know, quite recently, the China enacted new Coast Guard law, which came into force on the 1st of February of this year. And it is very controversial law because in many points, uh, in many points, it is contrary to ANCROS. So by two reasons, for two reasons, I think uh, European countries again tried to participate in the South China Sea. Thank you. Thank you. I think Professor Beckman. Yeah, I'm just very briefly. I believe that the European presence is a demonstration that the South China Sea issues have become a matter of international concern, not simply regional concern. Should be seen also in the context of uh, India and Australia and Japan and so on. Uh, the second issue, again, I'd like to stress that the so-called freedom of navigation or passage through the South China Sea doesn't address the fundamental question from the perspective of the coastal states in the South China Sea, and that is China, their view that China is claiming rights to resources which under the law of the sea convention belongs to them. A mere passage doesn't uh, affect that in any way. So that I think is the underlying issue, but I think it's probably welcomed by most states in the region as a demonstration that uh, there is a greater interest in the rules-based order set out in the Law of the Sea Convention. Thank you very much. Commander Kuma. You're still muted. Sorry. Sorry, to be very brief, I think uh, the more the merrier Initially, there were two, three countries which are going, so perhaps ASEAN nation may look at with suspicion what is there that they are only interested. More number of countries making it a practice, it will uh, give much more international uh, weightage to uh, diffuse the uh, practice of excessive maritime claim by China. And maybe other countries will find other friends uh, or, or confidant with whom they can start uh, doing business. And that area becomes more democratic, uh, if, if I use the word, by more number of countries going there and uh, showing their presence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before we come to the question from the, from the auditorium, uh, there's an interesting combined question and comment also in the chat, um, which highlights the fact that the 
you know, the, the upgrading, as I would put it, the expansion of the Chinese Navy might lead to the fact that uh, the Chinese Navy would operate more globally in the future, also with an interest to conduct operations, not only in the South China Sea, but globally, and that this could have a, an impact on how they see freedoms under the Law of the Sea Convention. But I would I'd like to see this as a, as a comment and um, not so much as a question because it's a very open question and I think we can cannot definitely answer that question. So if it's technically possible, I would really invite someone from our listeners to first quickly introduce yourself and then to ask the question if that is possible. I, have to, I need now help from our organizers if that is possible. It is possible, yes. Okay, let's just go ahead. Hi, could you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Wu Haidang. Uh, I'm from the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore. And I would like to have a question to Mr. Murdoch and uh, Dr. With. So uh, since you talk about um, European intervention to the South China Sea, during their recent passage to the South China Sea, the British and German warships have avoided to come close to theoretical minds of the China occupied islands. So does it imply any nuance um, in the position of the Great Britain and Germany with regards to the South China Sea? Thank you. Do you want me to take that one first? That would be great, yes. Sure. So, and I think obviously that, that follows on quite neatly from, from the, the, the last kind of discussion there. And, and I think the context of this is one of um, kind of multifaceted uh, positions by states, European and others, towards the, um, the disputes and, and what's at the heart of them. So I, I don't think you can see necessarily the, um, the movements of the warships in isolation to the, to, in terms of the messaging uh, being sent and, and, and the legal effect and otherwise of them. So, for example, um, submissions have been made, as you're probably aware, to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf by a number of states. Um, and those set out in some detail, for example, uh, the responses to uh, the Chinese uh, positions in that forum on, on, on claims which do affect the kind of natural resources, which goes to that that point that uh, Professor Beckman's making in terms of there are limits to what you, you what you can demonstrate by movements of ships, and that's that's important to note, and that there are other means by which you can uh, resist excessive claims uh, and unlawful claims. So that's one area. Um, the, the UK has also put out detailed legal position papers through its Parliament, uh, which cover the whole panoply of legal issues in the South China Sea putting in some detail its kind of position on, on various uh, legal claims and the basis for them. So, so those are kind of two important contributions at a state level, which obviously have um, importance, not just politically, but also as a matter of kind of state practice and opinion euros. And the third issue is one of uh, obviously movement of, of shipping. Um, and it has legal consequences. It shows kind of objection perhaps to, to excessive claims. Um, but in this instance, I think the actual um, passage of the warship is one, frankly, done through a number of factors of which, you know, the primary one is, is the conduct of navigation as to where, where you're coming from and where you're heading to. Um, and in terms of the, the, the passage route that you choose to apply for that route. Um, and I don't think there can be particularly any significance in, in terms of legal significance in particular routes, other than that the, the main one is the messaging that this is uh, an exercise of freedom of navigation by warships um, in an area which may be contested and disputed. Um, and I think that, you know, you have to then have regard to the kind of, not just the, uh, the passive the warships, but also what the accompanying messages that go with it. And that for, for the UK is those position papers and legal statements that made accompanying it. So I think you put that all together and I don't think you'll see any difference, frankly, between the UK and the US in terms of its rejection of the excessive claims. 
that doesn't necessarily mean that kind of just because they choose a different route, that means that there's this kind of difference in view. I think you have to look at all the actions by the state to do that. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I think I can add to that last point I would agree with. I mean, uh, in terms of the legal situation, this, uh, the view is quite clear, even though it cannot always be expressed uh, very clearly at, at the European level, at the EU level. Um, but you have the note verbal uh, also by the three countries being issued, so there's no question about that. Um, not least because these note verbals are much more precise and legally, I would say, effective when it comes to these questions than than uh, negotiation navigation warships or military presence. Having said that, I think there's a or, or that the question or the difference is, is that about this, the Kita of the rules based or what this actually means. If you read the German guidelines for the Indo-Pacific, they are relatively clear, much clearer than other countries' uh, views and debates on this. And that this is about the, the UN system, including UNCLOS, uh, that is about free trade and the rules for human rights. So, um, now the question is how do, how does that work in practice? How you how do you you know protect the rules based order um, rather than protecting freedom? The, the, you know, the freedom of navigation as it is in sea, and it becomes much more fuzzy. And it, it uh, partially, if you look at the debates also in Berlin, it became an umbrella term for, for, for different views and interests on international order, not so much on international order, not, not on international order. We have uh, people who are more on the US or Australian view on, on what the rules based order is, the, or the Japanese view for that matter where the US presence and the alliance structure is more important and transatlantic relations are important. And then, of course, you have others who don't agree or don't emphasize this uh, that much and really stick more to the, the definition that I just um, tried to describe in the guidelines. And, and that's where the di um, differences are. And, uh, unfortunately, that can also be felt in terms of signaling towards China and East Asia. Thank you. Um, there is a second element of a question from uh, from uh, or from the chat, uh, but it's it relates to the code of conduct. And uh, actually, we had already a discussion on the code of conduct, so I, I don't want to bring us uh, back to that. Um, if I if I just may abuse my moderator rights, and since we are approaching the the end, uh, getting closer to the end of the Q&A session, I have one question, one open question to our uh, panelists, and I would like to phrase it a little bit provocatively. Um, we are now five years after the award, uh, the, the South China Sea Award, uh, rendered um, by the PCIJ, and um, we, I would like to ask you, if, if we compare the situation five years ago and now, do you see any positive effect of the award um, or did it not change anything? What is the benefit of having the award now as a written document and, and carefully analyzed by a lot of scholars and governments all over the world? Because if we just have a look at the practical matters on the ground, you've seen the, what, we, what we label as the fisheries militia and other problems and we label it as harassment at sea, you could take the view that nothing much has changed after those five years. Actually, one could even take the view that things have gotten worse. So my question is, um, do we maybe need another clarification from a tribunal or even it loss, or do you see positive effects of the arbitration award from 2016? Professor Beckmann. And Professor Kanehara. But this time, Professor Beckman goes first. Thank you very much. I think that the what's interesting is that the reaction of states after the award in 2016 was very muted. And very few states were taking much of a position through the, as Andrew suggested, through the statements to the CLCS uh, diplomatic notes and uh, statements more states have clarified their positions with respect to at least China's position on the South China Sea. 
So it has clarified how the law of the sea issues apply in the South China Sea. It hasn't changed China's conduct, but it's put them in a more difficult position because they're now viewed by an increasing number of states as not only that their conduct is not only contrary to the law of the sea, but it's a threat to the sort of global order in the law of the sea convention. And the interesting challenge to me for China would be that as rightly pointed out by, can't remember if the moderator or one of the speakers, long-term China has the same interest in the law of the sea convention that the USA and the USSR had at the time the law of the sea was negotiated, that they are the next global maritime power. And the law of the sea convention provisions, as I read them, protect the interests of the world naval powers. So if you are the next naval power, what, you should not be undermining or challenging the system that protects your interests. You should be writing a thank you note to the Americans and the Russian Federation. I'll just stop there. Thank you. Okay, I think we have to wait a little bit for the thank you notes, but maybe in the future. Uh, Professor Kanehara. Thank you very much. Uh, it is true that after the award was rendered, China uh, clearly declared that such a decision is null and void. And also even the Philippines has not adhered to the decision. Under this uh, situation and facing this reality, but I think we should not give up legal approach against China. I can give you one strong reason for that. In the South China Sea case, it is clearly mentioned, it was clearly mentioned that even China tried to, and even now I think it tries to justify its notorious nine dash line by customary international law or general international law. So I strongly believe that China at least recognizes that power of international law to justify its activities. Of course, it will use it arbitrarily, but at least to a certain extent, China tries to use and China believes the power of public international law and UNCLOS. So I think we should not give up our legal approach against China. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have both Commander Kuma and Mr. Murdoch uh, in line commenting, wishing to comment. Uh, maybe um, Commander Kuma could go first. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think it has definitely made some change because if you remember after the tribunal's award, China stopped using the nine dash line. They've shifted to four show and you will not find them talking about nine dash line anymore. Second thing, it gives a light post for other countries to follow that perhaps this is the line will be followed if they also go to various uh, international agencies because this, uh, I mean, arbitration rule in favor of Philippines gives them an idea how to go about it to get things in a favor. And it will ultimately build up the mass wherein China will have to start thinking about it. So in my opinion, it is good and we should support and go ahead with that and encourage others also to take this report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Andrew thank you. I, yeah, I, I agree with those, those comments. I think uh, uh, overall the, the, um, the award has enabled states to find a kind of common reference points in order to articulate their, um, their responses to China's claims, which have, as I see it, also kind of evolved since the award and moving away from the kind of the nine dash line, not, not necessarily uh, disowning it, but certainly moving on to kind of a, these offshore archipelago type arguments. And I think that was certainly a response to the award. I mean, it, it may well be that the, the slightly muted response uh, that Professor, Professor Beckman mentioned was that, that, that obviously parts of that award, whilst obviously not binding on anyone, but the Philippines and China do, do touch on areas of approach to uh, particularly islands 
uh, and, and the requirements for states to uh, claim islands that are uh, able to um, claim generate more than a territorial sea and they may well look at that and say whether their own their own claims necessarily would meet that the relatively high bar that the the arbitrator set down in that case um, and feeling that that slightly inhibited them from going full blaze in terms of supporting every uh, legal rationale that the the tribunal reached as opposed to the overarching conclusions in it and I think that might might be something which where some states hesitated over coming in fully behind it uh, be, but that's absolutely right to say that the conduct itself though is not necessarily diminished uh, and in in areas it's evolved and through through other use of tactics and stuff and, and there clearly is a need for states to continue to be vigilant against that and and to push back within the framework of international law and i think this you know, whether there's any deterrent effect of another claim being brought against China, I think that that's something is that the Chinese will certainly take into account. They don't certainly welcome that uh, that engagement, um, and, and certainly I don't think would 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 go into too clearly where they think that's a real a real risk. Uh, I think it it has some form of deterrent attacks, even though they did say it was kind of as a previous speaker said, null and void. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. I haven't seen any indications of another uh, claim or another tribunal procedure being initiated, but it's certainly a political option. And thank you for confirming also the view that I have that the tribunal award, of course, has uh, an important both legal and political relevance, but I wanted to provoke you a little bit. Okay. Um, I don't see any open questions currently in the chat. And I think uh, even though we are maybe five minutes before uh, the half hour, I think we can conclude a, an excellent uh, uh, panel. Um, I don't know if it's possible that the, uh, that the presentations will be made accessible to viewers, but I have seen in those presentations and heard, of course, a, a, a wealth, a variety of further uh, recommendations and solutions that are relevant for this discussion. So uh, please let us not, uh, not forget also the, the, uh, the substance of, of the of the presentations that we had in the first part of, of the panel. But I would like to thank all panelists, all speakers for their contributions to this session. Um, and with that, I would actually like to conclude the session and hand over back to our organizers. It was a pleasure to be with you on the panel and thank you very much. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I hand over to our organizers uh, and mute my microphone. Thank you so much, Dr. Jessen. Well, I'm sure just as you are, uh, we have a lot of takeaways after these extensive discussions. And now for the closing remark, may I invite Dr. Nguyen Hung Sun, Vice President of the DAV to deliver the closing speech, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Master of Ceremony. Um, I have very little uh, to conclude uh, after a, a full day of uh, very rich and enlightening discussion. I uh, would like to, first of all, uh, extend my extreme uh, thanks and gratefulness to the excellent speakers and moderators who have, uh, well, uh, done a, a terrific job today to enlighten us on on such a uh, great, uh, important topic. We try to um, get as diverse a group of speakers as possible. Uh, we have speakers and moderators from 11 countries. We wanted more to participate so as to benefit from the different perspectives and viewpoints. We tried to get hold of a speaker from China, but unfortunately we were not successful. We hope uh, that the next time uh, we will have uh, a, a greater participation from our Chinese colleagues. Uh, but um, while well, the, the, the benefit uh, we got is uh, tremendous from uh, such a diverse group of speakers. We learn from your convergence of views, but we learn even more from your divergence of views. And I've, I sense that there are actually more convergence and divergence. Uh, on the sea level rise, I think um, we have um, a, a very similar understanding of how uh, that is uh, going to impact um, the, the maritime zones 
and the uh, well sovereign rights of the coastal states. Uh, less certain though is uh, the impact on the nature of the features on the need to reclassify uh, certain features in the middle of the oceans uh, by the impact of the South China Sea. And, and I'm glad that uh, the discussion in the first session uh, went at length uh, on elaborating on that. Um, well, the, the divergence seems to be on the options to deal with the impact of sea level rise from the actual adaptations to it, to the legal adaptations to it. Um, on the, uh, the, but, but I'm glad that um, the presenters presented a number of uh, options uh, that the coastal states, especially in uh, Southeast Asia can consider from uh, the uh, protection of their coastline, especially at significant point to the fixing um, of the um, maritime boundaries um, to make it future-proof uh, to sea level rise and into ideas like creating historical fishing zones um, in order to tackle the, uh, the, uh, the, the question of resources. Uh, on freedom and safety of navigation, I always felt that the aspect of safety of navigation is not, has not been adequately addressed or didn't receive uh, enough attention in scholarly debate uh, or, or the media. Uh, most of the attention is paid on, on freedom of navigation. So, I'm very glad that in today's discussions, we, we talk a lot about the, the safety aspect of the, uh, the equation. And I'm glad to have learned uh, a number of new phenomena that could impact uh, safety of navigation, such as the, uh, the increasing use of uh, underwater vessels, unmanned vehicles, uh, the new phenomenon, which is very critical in the South China Sea, which is maritime militias, and, um, and, and, and also uh, the aspects of uh, humane treatments of uh, people and vessels in distress at sea. But we also talked about the impact, um, the, the very contemporary impact of COVID uh, to uh, well, um, how it might impact um, uh, various aspects of safety with regard to uh, navigation at sea. Uh, with regard to freedom of navigation, I'm glad that um, many of the linkage between freedom of navigations and the code of conduct has been raised and discussed. This uh, code of conduct thing is important to Southeast Asia and to ASEAN and to Vietnam in particular. And I'm glad we, we talked about it. Oh, well, um, I don't have any intention of um, drawing any conclusion uh, from such a rich discussion. It's for you to draw your own conclusions and to take home whatever points you find necessary. But to me, it has been a, uh, a full day uh, of extreme uh, learning. And uh, as a non-legal expert, it's an eye-opening and ear-opening for me. So once again, I would like to thank you, excellent speakers, excellent moderators. I would like to thank you, the audience, uh, the invisible audience, um, for your participations and for your active um, more questionings and um, participations in the discussion. Uh, and finally, I would like to once again thank our sponsors, especially the KAS and the British Embassy in Hanoi for your support to make this event possible. Uh, so uh, once again, uh, let uh, please join me in um, uh, thanking uh, the speakers, the moderators, and for all the um, people who have helped organize this meeting behind the scene. Thank you very much. And we hope to um, be able to see you in person for our next Ocean Dialogue, hopefully in Hanoi or somewhere in Vietnam. Thank you and stay safe and goodbye everyone. Distinguished participants, we have come to the conclusions of the seventh Ocean Dialogue. And once again, on behalf of the organizer, we would like to extend our gratitude to all of you panelists, moderators, scholars, institutes, and also local provinces and diplomatic missions, agencies, universities, students, and the press for your presence and contributions. This event wouldn't have been made possible without all of you. And in order to pay tribute, we have prepared a short survey to directly hear from you about your thoughts, about the events, about our topics, and about our moderators, our speakers, and we will also follow up this event with a publications of original research paper from our very own panelists. And it will be our honor to continue to receive your support with this project, as well as 
uh, your support for our future events. We we'll look forward to seeing you soon in person or online. Come on. Bye. Bye-bye.